Hi, my name is Tom Partner and I'm a nurse practitioner and a certified teacher as well. Today I'm going to present a lesson on facial droop. The most common cause of facial droop is Bell's palsy. Unfortunately, there is no specific test for Bell's palsy. There's no x-ray, there's no blood test. Therefore, in order to determine if somebody's got Bell's palsy, you have to rule out some th other things that are far, can be far worse than Bell's palsy. Even though Bell's palsy is bad enough by itself, there's other things that are worse. There are approximately nine different basic causes of facial droop. Most of these are fairly impractical and very unlikely to cause, and if they do occur, they're fairly likely to be self-evident. The most dangerous of these is probably a stroke, cerebral vascular accident. A stroke can have many of the same, well, it don't have a facial droop, but it but it won't have, there's one thing that Bell's palsy will have that a, that a stroke usually won't have, or rarely or never has. And that would be for the person to have inability to move the four um, the muscles up here. These muscles are activated by the seventh cranial nerve. In Bell's palsy, these this nerve is um, basically diseased, thought to have some sort of infection. We're not sure what kind of virus infection, but maybe it's an infection. And so these seventh cranial nerve, this seventh cranial nerve is not working correctly. Therefore, in Bell's palsy, they will not be able to raise their eyebrows equally as I am there. They will be able to do that when a person has a stroke, however. So, <clears throat> when you inspect or when you see somebody who has facial droop, you always have to do a complete neuro check, but the most important one is, can you lift your, face, your brows? If you can lift your facial brows, then we know that you don't have Bell's palsy, and it could be something worse. It could be a stroke. A stroke, though, people will often have things like hemiplegia. That means one side of their body is weak. Um, they will also have um, difficulty speaking. If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, they could have a very, very bad headache and lose their consciousness and um, this is probably the worst type of stroke because there's not too much you can do for it except hope that, that it stops bleeding on its own. However, uh, the other type of stroke, there's various types of strokes that where the blood gets clogged, clogged, I'm sorry, clogged. It's a blood clot that forms in the brain. It, it can form in various places, and according to where it um, forms, you're going to get different symptoms. For example, if it happens in the central nervous system, more or less the, up here in the brain area, then you're going to get the things that I just talked about. Hemiplegia, weakness on one side, weakness on the whole side of the face, except the eyebrows. There's numbness on uh, part of the body, reduction in ability to, to feel things, altered sense of smell and taste and hearing. This is because there are other nerves, other than the seventh, say the third or the sixth cranial nerves that are affected by stroke. Why it doesn't affect the seventh cranial nerve very much, I don't know. 
But anyhow, it's a very good way to determine if it's a stroke or anyhow, not to determine, but to begin to give you guidelines. Do you, are you dealing with a stroke or are you dealing with Bell's palsy? The person who has a stroke may also have balance problems. They may also, if you ask them to follow your finger, you'll watch your eyeball and the eyeball will be going like this instead of nice and smooth. That's called nystagmus. Nystagmus, they might have difficulty breathing. They may have difficulty turning their neck. They may have difficulty raising their shoulders. All these are indications that somebody has a particular type of stroke. They may also have difficulty moving their tongue, sticking their tongue out, which is why one of the cranial nerves tests is to stick a person's tongue out. <clears throat> if there's a cerebellum, if, the, if they would have a stroke way down in the, towards the back, they're going to have altered gait, their difficulties walking, difficulty with uh, coordination, the fine motor coordinations may be reduced that eye to finger to finger, uh, finger to ear, finger to nose, those kind of coordinations will be reduced if it's a cerebellum type. They may also uh, complain of vertigo, feeling like the room is spinning. So we have a variety of types of stroke. But the most important thing here with stroke is almost always there's going to be more than one cranial nerve affected. There's going to be a variety. There's going to be more obvious symptoms. A person could also have a brain tumor that is putting pressure, you know, would be putting pressure, if that's a nerve, putting pressure on that nerve, the seven cranial nerve, that will also cause this problem up here with their seventh cranial nerve and those muscles that are worked by the seventh cranial nerve. However, brain tumors, they don't come and go and they don't come very fast. Usually Bell's policy will come on uh, during a night's sleep. Something happens during the sleep, the person wakes up and all of a sudden they've got this um, drooping on the one side of their face. So those are the two really dangerous things that have to be worn, a brain tumor and a stroke. Now, there's a bunch of other things that could happen that might have the same symptoms of a drooping face or similar, not exact, like I said, uh, Bell's palsy, the seventh cranial nerve is pretty specific to Bell's palsy. However, somebody also could have a sort of like a mini stroke or a partial uh, stroke that only lasts a while. We call that a transient ischemic attack. So a transient ischemic attack, that basically means there's a blood clot in an artery somewhere in the brain and it just lasts uh, for a short period of time. It could be seconds to maybe an hour. And if this occurs, usually, first of all, the symptoms will usually go away in an hour, usually less than an hour. The person, again, is probably going to have more variety of symptoms. Things like amaurosis fugax. That means they lost their vision. It could be seconds or minutes, maybe up to 60 minutes, rarely longer. And again, we talked about dizziness, uh, difficulty feeling. Maybe they have numbness. They have a one-sided weakness. Uh, they're they might have some drooping or some misshape in their eye. This is not caused the third cranial nerve, but rather the third and the sixth cranial nerves, not the seventh. Another possibility is a disease called sarcoidosis. And sarcoidosis is an autoimmune disease that usually strikes people with Scandinavian backward, background from age 20 to 30. Um, it has a variety of symptoms and most of the time is associated with a lung inflammation. But it can also have symptoms like rashes. The rashes can be on the face, the body, the legs. They can also have seventh nerve palsy. So this is a case that sarcoidosis in rare cases can actually affect that seven cranial nerve, same as Bell's palsy. But what's the difference going to be? The difference is going to be that the person is going to have other symptoms. 
They may have burning, tearing, tearing, itching around the eyes, painful eyes. They may have painful skin sores. They can have lesions in their back, their arm, their face, their scalp. They can have enlarged lymph nodes in their neck. They can have enlarged lymph nodes in their chest. They can have an enlarged liver and a large spleen. So a variety of problems with sarcoidosis. Therefore, it should be fairly easy to rule out. Another possible symptom or disease that could occur is herpes zoster. So herpes zoster of the seventh cranial nerve, so sometimes herpes zoster does affect the seventh cranial nerve and then we're going to get symptoms. And the other thing about the, to realize is sometimes when herpes first starts, it doesn't have the vesicles of the lesions. But then when it, it, it fulminates is when you get the vesicles, the little blisters that come out. Okay, so early on, the beginning of there might be numbness, tingling, burning sensation around that seventh cranial nerve and possibly some uh, forehead uh, muscle drooping or inability to raise the forehead there. Another possible disorder is Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is um, a disorder of the eighth cranial nerve. It's not the seventh cranial nerve, but it's the eighth cranial nerve. And because it's sort of close to the eye, the person may have um, symptoms there as well. They may have a little bit of facial paralysis down here, but not up here because it's the eighth radial nerve and not the seventh. They may also have loss of taste, of sensation over part of their tongue, which, by the way, sometimes people with Bell's palsy will also complain of that. They may have vertigo and uh, loss of equilibrium, especially when it's dark and they cannot see. They may have more likely to have motion sickness. Um, they're also more likely to have pain in the ear, and especially they're more likely to have vesicles, again, on the ear. And again, that's because the eighth cranial nerve is infected, and it's believed to be that there's some sort of virus of that eighth cranial nerve, so could be sort of like a mild herpes case causing that eighth cranial nerve to have those vesicles. But again, it's... Um, should be, you should be, these other symptoms, other than the forehead not drooping, you should have these other symptoms, pain in the ear, um, lower facial drooping, um, so that you can recognize Ramsey-Hunt syndrome versus Bell's palsy. Another possible disorder that a person could have that sometimes causes uh, of a facial or drooping is Lyme disease. So Lyme disease can sort of be ruled out if you can say, well, the person hasn't been traveling, the person's been having good bathing habits, they've been bathing every day, because the person, in order to get Lyme disease, has to be exposed to a Lyme, and the Lyme actually has to, I'm sorry, has to be exposed to a tick, and the tick has to be infected. And not only does the body have to have this tick on it, but the tick has to be on the body for 24 hours. If it's not on the body for 24 hours, it's very, very unlikely that this tick, even if it were infected, can infect the person. So if you can look back in that person's history, and this person has no history of traveling, and it has very good hygiene, then it's unlikely that the person would have Lyme disease. But Given it, let's, let's assume that maybe the person did have some of these symptoms, then he, may, he or she may eventually get these bullseye rash. They start, but they start out with this uh, erythematous uh, macular rash, as you see here, and then the rash sort of works outward from the center, giving it a, a target or a bullseye 
type appearance. But the person also, when they're first infected, usually has flu-like symptoms, a headache, muscle soreness, fatigue. Later, maybe they've had this disorder going on for three months, they might get other symptoms. This is where they might get facial paralysis. Again, it's more of a general facial paralysis, not simply seventh cranial nerve. They may also get symptoms on meningitis. They get headache, neck ache, sensitivity to light, pain, radicular pain, pain that's sort of going down from the arms, numbness, tingling, burning, or going down the legs. We get memory loss, sleep problems, and they mood changes. And they may even get a change in their heart electronic signals causing what we call atrial ventricular block, blocking that, that um, electronic message from the atrium down to the ventricles. So again, not very likely, but it could happen. Myasthenia gravis is another unlikely cause, but it's still possible. So what is myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis is a disease caused by antibodies that the body's making blocking acetylcholine from leaving the nerve cells and delivering a message to the muscle cells. And myasthenia gravis has numerous types, but most, of the, most all the types do involve facial muscles. Myasthenia gravis, though, is more likely to call ptosis. This is a falling down of the eyelid. It is not, again, they will still continue to be able to move their eyebrows. It is not seventh cranial nerve involvement. Um, <clears throat> so if it's myasthenia gravis, we're more likely to see the eyelid coming down. And if it goes to different parts of the body, you might see other symptoms, such as a little bit of weakness in a variety of muscles in the body. So those are the nine possible, or nine possible reasons for facial droop. I have to say there's always a possibility of something else. Some of the literature says that it could be diabetes. I've never, I've seen a lot of people with diabetes, and I've never seen anybody with a facial droop as a result of diabetes. But it doesn't mean it hasn't happened or it couldn't happen because diabetes does affect the nerves. So if you affect the nerves, you could possibly get facial droop. So because this is a diagnosis of exclusion, that is Bell's palsy, this is why if you go to a doctor, the doctor is going to have to not just look at you and ask you a question, but he'll probably do a neurological check. Check all the cranial nerves, check your, uh, your muscle strength, check your reflexes, ask you to stand and walk. All these things are part of a neurological exam which can help him to rule out these other causes. So just in conclusion, remember, there are very few things it's going to cause this inability of this forehead to move. Bell's palsy, Ramsey-Hunt disease are two that can do that. Other ones will cause other areas of the face and eyes not to move properly. But the eyebrow, which is nervated by the seventh cranial nerve, usually does work properly in those diseases. Thank you for listening to my lesson on facial droop.